Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to your next flipped classroom lecture. This weekend's lecture is going to look at the act of fragging in Vietnam um, and a little bit of the history of it and where the term comes from and then how it applies to our novel. Uh, so let's get started. Fragging was uh, an act that really kind of came to prominence during the Vietnam War, um, was not prevalent before and has not been an issue after, um, but it is the killing of a superior officer. So when someone kills their superior. And as I said, it really kind of came up in Vietnam. It really became a concern uh, in 1971 uh, when Mike Mansfield was a uh, representative from Montana, and he really he raised the issue on the floor of the Senate and really kind of brought um, up this the death of a lieutenant, actually, um, which is kind of coincidental, but it was the death of Lieutenant Duello, or Delwo, excuse me, Lieutenant Delwo. Um, he was the one who really was the kind of person who brought all of this to the national attention uh, was the death of Lieutenant Delwo. Mike Mansfield brought it to the attention of the Senate. Uh, he was killed in March 15th, 1971. So, the history of fragging is very closely tied to the Vietnam War. Uh, as you've learned in your research project, the Vietnam War was a very controversial war. At the beginning of the controversy, soldiers just practiced what was called combat refusal, and that was just refusing to go into uh, dangerous situations, and they would just refuse the commands given to them by a superior officer. Um, and this picture over here is actually uh, a squadron of men who have just refused to go into uh, battle. They've just refused something to do. Um, they have been told to go back out. They'd just gotten done with a mission, and they've been told they were going to go back out, and they had just refused to do that, and this picture just happened to be snapped. That was where the, the pushback from the enlisted men really started, was with just com just combat refusal, refusing to go out into situations they felt was dangerous. That escalated, though, into these incidents of fragging, and as I pointed out, it really was brought to the public's attention in 1971, but it had been going on before that, as we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, the name fragging comes from the device that was most commonly used, and that is the uh, M61 fragmentation grenade. Uh, they were issued to all soldiers. The soldiers wore them kind of across their chest sometimes in a Rambo style. They would shove them into pockets. Um, it was just kind of something that soldiers would carry. The M61 fragmentation grenade, or any fragmentation grenade for that matter, is was a really, really good device for killing people that you didn't want to necessarily get caught killing for a number of reasons. Uh, the first is its size. It's very small. It's the size of a basketball. It um, does not take up a lot of space. It's very easily hidden. It's very easily placed somewhere and kind of not seen. The size of it makes it uh, a big advantage. The second one is it's silent. It has no fuse. Um, after you pull the pin, this guy right here, uh, and you depress the lever, you've activated the grenade. Um, as soon as you release the lever, then that starts the internal fuse. And the internal fuse is completely silent and there's no smoke. And so once the device is armed, it's almost impossible to tell, one, how much time you have, and two, to locate it in a particular place. Uh, and number three, I wish it started with an S so we could have uh, some nice alliteration going here. Uh, number three was... it. It destroyed itself. It left no evidence. It's called a fragmentation grenade because when it explodes, you get all these little 
fragments of stuff flying everywhere, all the shrapnel, uh, and that that's what causes so much damage. That also means, though, that there's no evidence. There's no way to tell whose grenade it was or where the grenade was found or any of that. And it really kind of creates... Uh, this perfect murder tool, I guess you could say, if you didn't want to get caught. Uh, most people don't want to get caught when they commit murder. Fragging was a new problem in Vietnam. As you can see, this snippet from a website says that World War I saw just one incident leading to court-martial. That means one incident they were able to prove uh, per 12,700 servicemen. So that's a really, really low number of incidents. Uh, by the time we get to Vietnam, the fragging rate rises from for to one in 3,300 3, all the way up to one in 572 servicemen. It means out of 572 servicemen, one of them was going to attempt an act of fragging. That is a huge jump in numbers. It's really kind of terrifying. Um, the assumption is that these men didn't want to die for a cause they didn't believe in, um, and so that the the fragging was a result of their their morals and their beliefs that they were being asked to do things that they felt were unwise and were unsafe and were putting them in danger, and they were just not agreeing to those. There's been a lot of not a lot of research, I should say. The research that has been done is a little controversial because. What it has found is that actually these soldiers were acting more out of personal grievances, personal grudges, and that a lot of times uh, drugs were involved. Marijuana was very prevalent during Vietnam and large amounts of heroin as well. Um, and so the research actually shows that instead of morals and beliefs, it may have been people acting out of grudges and drug use, which really kind of changes the, I don't know if you could call it the noble aspect of killing someone because you refuse to put yourself in danger and just kind of turns it into yet another kind of cowardly crime uh, because you're angry at somebody and you happen to have a gun or a grenade in this case. However, for whatever the reasons, it's clear that fragging became a very serious problem in the war. Uh, we can see starting where numbers were first tracked, they didn't keep track even until 1969, but in 1969, up until 1971, the numbers really started to rise. We have this really sharp drop-off here because guess what? In 1972, that was when we began to pull out and withdraw. And as a result, the number of incidents went down, lending support to the idea that the soldiers were committing these crimes because they were scared for their lives. Uh, we can also see again, so the number of AWOLs absent without leaves, those rise all the way up to 84 soldiers per 1,000, a huge number again. And then the number of just straight up desertions of, of soldiers who just willingly walked away from their post, uh, again, all the way up to almost, almost 34 per 1,000 troops at their highest point in 1971, which is kind of when the war really hit. Uh, hit bottom in terms of its popularity with soldiers and with the public. Um, it was not a good time. Um, our incident in going after Cacciato actually takes place in 1968, so before some of these sharp rises in fragging. Remember that in going after Cacciato, it's Oscar who convinces 3rd Squad that they need to eliminate Sidney Martin because he's putting them in danger uh, Lieutenant Martin making them follow all of their standard operating procedures, searching the tunnels, doing things like that. Uh, the view that going after Cacciato presents is definitely one of self-preservation. In fact, I believe that Oscar calls it that several points, that it's about self-preservation. It's about protecting themselves from a superior officer who doesn't understand what he's trying to put them through. Um, so for, at least for going after Cacciato, the idea was self-preservation. Just a very brief introduction to fragging. There's, there's lots of interesting sources online. Um, all of the information I presented to you guys tonight can be found on these two websites right here. Um, 
They make for very interesting reads just in terms of trying to figure out you know, what it would take to kill someone who was your superior officer, your commanding officer. It's very interesting. Uh, so I encourage you, as always, to go do more research. Research the things that you're interested in and find them out. Uh, never, never be satisfied with what you've learned in a lecture. I always encourage you to go out and find more information. Uh, please make sure you complete the quiz at the bottom of this blog page, as well as pay attention to any extra credit opportunities that may be posted down there as well. Um, that's all. Mr. Miller signing off.